Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this first investment webinar for Mercer for 2022. It's really terrific uh, that you've all been able to join us today, and I can see the, the numbers are increasing um, pretty quickly, so um, we'll get on with things to um, be respectful of people's time. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet in Australia today, the various lands around the country, and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Kiora, of course, to all of our New Zealand audience, we always get a really nice, strong uh, participation from our friends across the ditch, and so we're glad you've been able to join us today. Uh, of course, uh, just a bit of a shout out to everybody. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, I find myself in isolation today, um, as I know many of you will be, uh, and indeed have, you know, since we last met in the last webinar in December, have perhaps had COVID yourself or within your family, but I hope you're all, you're all doing uh, well and are safe. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers for today, and we have a very special guest with us, Rich Newsom, who's the global president for Mercer for in investments and retirement and Rich is based in New York and so it's actually terrific to have him out one of our first global visitors I believe that we've had to our shores probably for a couple of years now I would say um, so it's really terrific to have you with us today Rich and really looking to hear some of your your global insights uh, and we've also got Craig Hughes who heads up our investments solutions business locally in the Pacific and Craig's got a really great perspective on uh, what's going on across the local client base and um, again Craig really thrilled to get your insights today uh, you will remember any of those who did join us for the December webinar, we had with us Nick White and Guion Moore, and they were really talking about uh, our themes and opportunities or the, the, the things that we thought we were, were going to play out in investment markets over 2022 and a little bit about our market outlook as well. Um, and I think what we were really hoping to do today was to really build on that conversation around you know really these dynamics that are likely to play out at I think quite a bit pivotal time to be honest for investment markets um, to, but to build on that with you know what we're seeing in terms of investor activity and focus and hopefully through that to be able to give you some quite um, perhaps actionable insights for the way that you're thinking about your own portfolios and the way that you've got them uh, positioned. So before we launch into the Q&A, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. So we will have time for Q&A at the end. So if you can please uh, pop any questions that you've got in the Q&A function within Zoom, you can do that at any time and we'll come back and we'll pick those up at the end. Uh, and we do really like to get the audience questions. So uh, please please put in anything in there that you wanna, wanna hear the speakers talk about. Um, other things are, uh, we are recording this session today and we will send out a recording, a link to the recording in a post webinar email for you to view at your leisure or to share. Um, also, as you exit today, uh, there will be a short poll, um, feedback poll for you to complete and we'll just really encourage you to complete that if you can, because we do really value your feedback and we absolutely take it into consideration when we're uh, thinking about formats for, for future um, events. So we really appreciate you just spending a moment uh, to do that. That'd be terrific. Okay, Rich, really, really uh, looking forward to hearing from you. And as we were putting this webinar together, it, you know, it really struck me that you've got quite an incredible role actually. And I think in the context of the, the global investment community, you're probably one of the people in the world that's got the broadest line of sight across investor activity because you really cover Mercer's global business across our consulting clients and through into our investment solutions as well. And so I thought a great way to start this would just be to, to get some insights from you on the kind of things that you're you're seeing going on out there, particularly across our investor and client base. Yeah, thanks, Kylie. First, I want to thank the Australian government for letting me in. I was uh, thrilled when I arrived and took my post-arrival COVID test and got one line instead of two and knew I could spend the week <laughs> actually with clients and colleagues and, and doing things as opposed to in, in, uh, in quarantine in the hotel. Um, our, our clients globally, and I think investors more generally, from sovereign wealth, wealth funds down to endowments and foundations, insurers, all types of asset owners, fiduciaries, are very concerned about achieving their investment objectives in the future going forward. 
if if we look at the 10 years through December 31st, it, it's just about exactly the best 10 years ever for a 60-40 publicly traded stock bond portfolio in US dollar terms, in real return terms. It, it's just about exactly the best 10 year calendar period ever, and, and certainly one of the best ever. But on a go forward basis, we ended the year and even today, the real yields, 10 year real yields in every major currency are negative. And while nominal yields have moved up some since your end, inflation expectations have also moved up. So that's still largely the case today. So on a go forward basis, in no asset class are investors looking at it and saying, well, relative to my experience during my career, this is gonna be similar to what my stakeholders have gotten. And so how do, how do we achieve our investment objectives going forward? And there's no easy, easy answer, but some of the common themes are diversifying the portfolio as much as possible making more aggressive use of the liquidity budget by, by investing more in liquid assets, pushing into private market alternatives, including new sub-asset classes of private markets more heavily. And then for investors that believe they have the governance to pick active managers and beat the market, really adding on additional active risk, trying to do that to engineer better alpha net of fees. So for investors who believe they can do that, pushing that lever harder in a, in a low real interest rate environment. And that all quickly gets back to how good is your governance? So it's driving a war for talent globally for in-house staff. It's driving clients to upgrade their, their consulting advisors. It's driving some organizations to look at, do we use an outsourced chief investment officer for some of these new asset classes and focus our attention where we've got comparative advantage in our in-house resources? Those are some of the common themes. Yeah, and certainly consistent, uh, I think, with things that are top of mind um, for investors locally as well. I just wonder, um, and they're all very sensible things to focus on, I think, particularly given where we're at, but are there things that you, um, perhaps if you, you overlay your own perspective or sort of the Mercer perspective onto that, are there things that you, you think perhaps that asset owners are focusing on or, or not focusing on that perhaps they they should be? Um, what I wish more asset owners would do is get their most senior stakeholder body, their investment committee or board in a room and do it when people aren't distracted and ideally in a physical room, which has been very hard during COVID for committees to meet and say on your desk, there's an envelope and open the envelope and read the case study that this is, this is, you know, let, let's re-experience March of 2020 or February of 2009 but let's imagine it's worse because March of 2020, the COVID downturn, stock markets were down 45%, but they were down for about two weeks and they bounced back. The massive fiscal and monetary stimulus worked. The stock market came back quickly. You know, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to grab the bottom really, but, but by the time people really um, got panicked about the situation, the situation already improved a lot. We, we really haven't been challenged in the last 20 years with a major sustained capital markets crisis. And I, I wish that more asset owners were trying to help their boards pre-experience that and move from, can we stay with our risk budget to, are we wired up to grab the opportunities when that happened? You, you know, I mentioned that, that asset owners are focused on their governance. One of the tests is, did we rebalance in March of 2020 and how many times? Did we grab any of the opportunities that are out there in high yield debt or even, even investment grade debt or did we miss those opportunities when we actually had a market correction and could have gotten significant value? Um, there's, there's a lot of angst amongst in-house staff that when they look at their investment communities and boards, there's very few people who are around for the GFC. That generation's turned over now. It's only been 12 years, but turned over. And there's nobody really who's been around long enough to have experienced a year where markets are down more than 20% and stayed that way for six or eight months. Yeah, so you're you're almost talking to a bit of a recency bias there too, I think, you know, it has been quite some time since we've had a sustained drawdown. So that, that you know, perhaps a level of risk complacency uh, or complacency to risk, you know, it's very easy for that to creep in when you haven't experienced it uh, for an extended period of time, for a long time. Um, Craig, um, can I just come to you? So just, just wondering, you know, super keen to get your perspective. Um, you've got a lot of line of sight to investors and asset owners here across the Pacific. So what are you seeing locally and where are people most worried or, or where are they focusing? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Look, everything you said there, Rich, certainly applies you know, to our Australian and New Zealand investors. But just thinking about what's top of mind right now, I think it's the first time 
I can remember for a while where the issues aren't the same. At the moment, New Zealand investors are very much focused on pretty much what the rest of the Western world is, which is you know 6% inflation, you know, 30-year high inflation, cash rates are already jacked up a couple of times, 10-year bonds are getting towards 3%. And that's a completely different environment to what they've faced for so long. So they're having to deal with that. In Australia, of course, we haven't, you know, that, that's coming, we think. Uh, it's on the way. We haven't had to deal with that right now. So you think about what the Australian investors, certainly in the superannuation space, have been dealing with the last sort of nine months or so. It's been to meet the needs of, of NASIC and APRA, you know, around the your future, your super, and you know, making sure you can pass those tests. Now it's the retirement income issues, you know, making sure you've got a strategy for that. These are regulator initiated issues, not so much, you know, what's the next inflation number. All, all those things are going to be important. The top of mind right now uh, are those types of issues here. So it's quite different. One thing I do want to say, though, Kelly, for, for both investors, though, there's one pretty much common theme that's been there all the way through and very much the same at the moment, which is around the ESG sustainable investment topic. You know, this is front and square for all, all investors across across all, certainly our investors in this region, but also more broadly. Um, we know it's been, you know, basically around climate, you know, that's been the big discussion point of last year, but that's really broadening. I mean, I'm seeing it almost on a week by week basis at the moment where that's morphing into a real impact assessment. You know, what can we do in this area to do more than what we're doing now? And I know that we've been, you know, our investors pretty much along with Canadian and the Nordic areas are leading this, you know, this discussion and action but there's no holding back on that. You know, this is still going to very, very much flat foot. And it's, you know, we've talked about what, what are the issues at the, the top of mind, that's certainly the one. And finally, really just on China, I know we're a bit closer to so I'm a bit more reliant on them, but um, look, we have seen some interesting views, some mixed views from our clients uh, as to how we think the China situation will play out. Both that, you know, last year, the anti sort of market rhetoric you know, that's still playing out. And now there's now effectively the zero COVID response and whether that's going to keep going because ultimately this does play out for, for growth prospects. And you know, so we're tied into this. So it's not a universal view. There's still some options around it, but it's one that's getting traction and, and we need to be, you know, you know we, we need to be able to pay attention to it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's sort of interesting there and you're both sort of alluding to it in your questions, that concept of scenario testing and stress testing, I think, you know, is going to be perhaps more important as we move forward from here. And there are, you know, a number of different potential scenarios that could play out. I mean, there always are, but it feels at this point in time, perhaps, you know, that that. Uh, process becomes more important uh, as well and you know just to acknowledge your comments there around ESG and sustainability as well and I, I, I think it's been really good to see that particularly where there's been labelled funds sustainably labelled funds I know it's true for our own funds but also across the industry have performed very very well and not just for a short period of time actually those numbers are, uh, are getting long term now in terms of the track record for sustainably labelled funds and I think that that's supporting or at least helping to cut through any perception or perhaps past held belief that you know investing sustainably is not aligned or could detract from from returns and I think that only then once you get to that belief or, or or have managed to dispel you know perhaps a myth that you couldn't invest sustainably and generate strong returns it only you know keep, keeps the momentum behind uh, the focus on that as well. Um, Rich, I just wanted to come back to you because uh, I think most people who join this call are multi-managers, so we're largely making asset allocation and active manage management, manager selection decisions, uh, but we're using obviously the skills and expertise of external investment managers. I also know that we have a lot of uh, investment managers who join, do join these events as well. So welcome to all of you. So we've talked a little bit from the asset manager side of things, but I'm just sort of curious on your insights or perspectives of you know, big uh, actions or activities or themes that you're playing that are playing out across the investment manager space and particularly interested where you might be seeing areas of um, innovation that might be of benefit to asset owners and and uh, you know, the, the next level up investors. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit three, Kylie. One is um, M&A activity at the large end is going to continue. Uh, firms that believe they have a strong core competency in owning and operating uh, multi-boutique investment structures 
that they can provide the marketing, sales, client service, reporting support to distribute good product globally, they're going to continue to grow and add capabilities. At the other end of the market, we have lost about two years of new form, new firm formation. So, so teams that were ready in late 2019 to go out and set up their own shop and, and take the risk of, of starting Newsom Associates or Newsom Hughes Wellman Associates. You know, not that we're going to do that. Don't don't tell our bosses. But um, you know, if if you were going to go out and set up your own shop, you had to hold off because it's very hard to do that. It's been very hard to do that during COVID. You know, you may have had your friend and family money lined up, but the ability to go out and convince new asset owners, consultants, OCIOs to to use you when they can't do an on-site visit, they can't meet you in person, very tough. So we've lost two years of innovation on new investment processes being launched in new shops. Um, I think we're, we're going to see particularly strong innovation is in the private market space and in the venture capital and, and growth equity space. And to try to motivate that, we've seen a long-term decline in the number of publicly traded stocks in developed markets globally and a long-term growth in the amount of capital available in private markets. And I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Um, about five years ago, we had a sovereign wealth fund ask us, what's the most money we could put into venture capital without moving the market? And we did some analysis and came back to them with a figure. And then we had a second fund in a different country ask the same question, and a third and a fourth and a fifth. And we suddenly realized, okay, <laughs> individually, they may not move the market, but in practice, they're gonna move the market. And so we've seen a massive amount of investment in venture capital globally broadening out by geography, broadening out by industry segment, not just in tech, which, which is hugely stimulative to the global economy in terms of the pace of disruption of all, of all standard business models. And there's a chicken and egg thing. When you've got that much money chasing new ideas, two kids in a garage are gonna take down entire sectors of the public equity market. And you can only get exposure to those two kids in the garage through, through the private market space. And they're not gonna need to go public until they get to a billion or 10 billion in capital. We, we have the phenomenon of unicorns, we have the phenomenon of decacorns. So I think that's a major change in the capital markets. And again, these things all challenge governance for, for investors. You know, there are lots of investors out there who would say, well, we, we don't invest in fund one or fund two, we wait for fund three. Or we don't invest in new shops, we wanna see a track record, we wanna see that the team's been together. But if you have those types of past success-based criteria, you would never access a new firm. You would never access a startup in the venture capital or early growth equity space. So you miss out on huge swaths of innovation in the capital markets, and you end up investing in large publicly traded companies that have succeeded historically, but may not be the leaders going forward. Yeah, really interesting, Rich. Um, thanks for sharing those those insights with with us. Um, we've talked a, a lot about sort of some of the big picture uh, activities that are going on, but I just wanted to pause for a moment on um, something, I guess, a particular topic that we know is very uh, top of mind for a lot of investors, and that's inflation. Uh, and so we're certainly at a bit of a juncture here where we've had a very low inflation environment for a long time. Uh, we've certainly been beneficiaries as investors of the very strong stimulus that's been provided by central banks and government governments around the world, both pre the pandemic and certainly through the, through the, this uh, pandemic uh, recovery period. But, you know, things are changing now. A lot of that stimulus is starting to fuel inflation. So there's, if, if nothing else, even if you've got views about how long inflation is here for and what it, where it's going to land and what are the long-term inflationary forces, if nothing else, there's a lot more inflation uncertainty around now than I think we've experienced for quite some time. So I think what I was um, interesting to um, understand maybe from, from both of you from perhaps a global and local perspective is what's your, your best tips, I guess, for managing a portfolio in an inflation uncertain environment? I, I think it's to work back from your long-term objectives and your portfolio where you think the portfolio is robust to the different ends of the policy response spectrum. I don't think the issue for most of our clients is short term inflation. It's in which direction will governments and monetary authorities get the policy response wrong. And I don't say that meaning disrespect to the very smart people in government who are, who are trying to do the right thing in terms of fiscal policy or monetary policy, but we have a full employment economy. We're emerging from a pandemic. Um, we are throwing record volumes of fiscal stimulus at that economy. We are throwing record volumes of, of quantitative easing and monetary stimulus at that economy. If, if you took a good fixed income manager 
and put them in the time capsule 10 years ago and took them out of the time capsule and they hadn't lived through the last 10 years. And you told them employment is at all time highs globally, unemployment's at all time lows. Um, this is what the stock market's done. This is what fiscal policy is doing. We just had an inflation print in the US of seven and a half percent in January. Where do you think short term interest rates are? Where do you think long term interest rates are? They might say three and a half or higher on short term interest rates. They might say five and a half, seven, eight percent on long term interest rates. They wouldn't say long term interest rates are flirt flirting with two percent and short term interest rates are zero. It's just an amazing disconnect. Or another way of looking at it, the Federal Reserve balance sheet is nine trillion dollars. That's half the size of the US economy. That's that's six times annual GDP in Australia. And there is no agreement among Fed policymakers as to how to unwind that balance sheet. So aside from what's going to go on with short-term interest rates, you have in one economy with a reserve currency, you have disagreement among the people taking the decisions as to how quickly do they do they take that nine trillion down and, and suck up that liquidity out of the market. So it's very unlikely that we get the policy response exactly right. And and you start with your long-term objectives, you end up with diversification, you end up with governance, and, and ideally governance where if it's wrong in the short term and market's correct, you're able to grab opportunities, at least rebalance, by ideally grab opportunities from people who, other investors who weren't prepared for that, then run for the exits and, and make things available to you at a valuation that we haven't seen in the last 10 years. Thanks, Rich. I wonder if I could come to you, Craig, on that, just, you know, maybe to extend on that with your own perspective and how we're working with local clients around making sure they've got uh, inflation protection built into the portfolios. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Look, I think one of the, the, the good features of the, the local market here is there's been a real willingness to embrace new asset classes over the past 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and a lot of those new asset classes are in the private markets. So they've got good, chunky allocations to private markets, property and infrastructure, which one of the, the features of those, which we haven't really needed in the past, but one of the features in, is some inbuilt inflation protection. You know, it's, it's, they come with well with good diversification, but they have this feature where you know rentals and, and toll roads, et cetera, are literally built in uh, you know, into the latest increase in the CPI. So we we, we always say from a diversification, have those real assets, and that will provide you with a core of inflation protection. But at the, at the end, you know, to, to achieve, you know, you know, I think all our clients are CPI plus objective overall. You know, you need to generate reasonably good returns. So it's across equities. You, know, you need to have the right managers in this environment. You need to have the right portfolio construction. And ultimately, it's around your bond portfolio. It's around that 20, 30 percent that you've got in cash and defensive investments. Ensure that they're less duration as much as you can, and more absolute return, more use, as we sort of talked about before, some, some sort of private debt type allocation where, as interest rates rise, you can take advantage of that without getting you know, that, that big hit. On, on, on the bond holders. And one of those things just in particular to note is often you hear about CPI bonds, you know, the, the you know, long duration CPI bonds being a protection against you know, rises in CPI. Well, it's great for the coupon to do that. But if you're holding a 10 year duration bond that's going up in the yield, you know, quite substantially, you're going to blow that out in the short term. So be careful as to what you think are inflation protection instruments and always look for, you know, I guess, maximum diversification. Think about share shares should do okay in the environment. You have to think about what type of managers or shares you're going to buy. But in principle, that's how we, you know, good diversification, equity portfolios, real assets, and just watch what you're doing on the on, on, on the bond side. Yeah, really good, Craig. I mean, there's a there's a really common theme across today around this importance of diversification and how, you know, I think very much of the view that it's going to be back in favor, if you like. We haven't needed actually a lot of diversification or it hasn't been rewarded. For, for a while now, but um, certainly seeing more need for diversification as we move forward from here. But I wonder if you could each share with us what you think some of the inhibitors to that might be, because it's all very easy to say, you know, have this nice, well diversified portfolio, but some of these things that we're talking about here, there's a skill set question, there's a cost question, there's an access question. Um, so, Rich, I wonder if you've got any. Um, you know, what, what do you see as some of the inhibitors to an investor actually building a well diversified, robust portfolio? Um, the, the biggest one I've seen is the, the recency bias that you mentioned earlier, Kylie. We've had such good news and, and consultants, you know, there's a saying that even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, for 10 years, we've been telling clients, 
this will, at some point, stock markets won't go up. At some point, bond markets won't behave well. Please diversify. And stocks keep going up and bond markets keep behaving well up until the end of the calendar year. <laughs> but um, so, so, so stakeholders, it's, it's been hard meeting via Zoom to take fundamental decisions around we're going to put a lot of our liquidity budget to work. We're going to invest in new asset classes. We're going to pay I've seen multiples of what our average member makes in salary to in-house staff because we need sophisticated people to help us do this or we'll be at the dumb money at the table and giving liquidity to people with insider information. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality when you do private markets. If, if you don't have a comparative advantage, you're at a comparative disadvantage. In the public markets, we can free ride on market efficiency. My mother-in-law, who is um, really nice but, but has trouble taking my advice, she can buy an index fund and do better than 80% of active investors in the public markets. But in the private markets, you can't do that. You're, you're playing with other people. You're looking for an information advantage. You better, if you don't have the comparative advantage, you're, you're you know, it's saying that you look around the poker table, if you don't know who the dumb money is, it's you. And, and so there's a lot of fear of um, giving up liquidity of investing in these asset classes and a lot of noise about record levels of dry powder and valuations are too high and the IRRs are lower than they've been in our careers. All of which is true, but then you look at negative real yields, and Craig mentioned the role of a bond portfolio. So there's no easy answers in this in this type of environment. But I think the inhibitors around governance, and you don't want to um, when you embark on a private market investment program. So, so a cardinal rule as an investment consultant is never exceed your client's risk tolerance. And the acid test is imagine that you start into your new private equity allocation, and the plan is to build this up over seven years. And one year in, there's a 40% downturn. And everything you just invested in is underwater. It's lost money already. What's the board's response? The response you want, if you've done a great job with the governance is, wow, what a great time to double down. Let's buy secondaries. Let's go faster. We want to put more money to work. Thank God we got a correction. Not, oh my gosh, we just started investing in this asset class and we've lost 20% of our principal. You know, we made a mistake. So, so it, it does come down to governance. I think that's a big inhibitor. And it's very hard to bring diverse groups along and get them truly comfortable with doing something new if you can't get in person to have those discussions and, and hash it out. Yeah, well, let's hope we'll, we're all able to have a bit more face-to-face uh, -face time to have those kind of discussions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's it, the, the governance point is a really uh, good one there and setting, uh, you know the right assessment of your risk tolerance as well which again in a period of time where we haven't had that challenge sort of an interesting thought to have um craig local um challenges you see to to diversification yeah look i think the main one here is around fees uh we've seen it here in australia you know for a few years now uh, but i'm just maybe taking up the, the issue in the new zealand market really where it seems to have gone even further um, we've had some experience recently there where effectively you don't offer, you know, all listed index markets, you know, for the cheapest fee that you, you can get, you know, that real race to the bottom, uh, you know, then you're not going to win. You know, and that's a real shame because, you know, while, while it has been okay for the last 10 years or so, we know it's not going to be okay. We know our modelling suggests it's not going to be okay. You need diversification and you need it when it counts. And I think all of us are probably suggesting, you know, when it counts, it's going to be, you know, reasonably soon. So... That, that's a real issue because if you don't have that fee budget, and I certainly with the way in which you the government side, that's very important. If you don't have the fee budget, if you don't have that, that capacity to spend on non listed markets uh, and take that longer term view with that, then you're going, to be, you're going to be in trouble at some point in the cycle. And that's coming up sooner than probably what, what, what people think. So that, that for us is okay. I think in Australia, it's still an issue. It's not as much because I think we've got a long history of, certainly in the institutional side, of. You know, property infrastructure type investment. Um, so we've got that bit of diversification in there. But when, when we see what's happening in New Zealand, the mums and dads as part of the schemes over there, the, the Kiwi Saver schemes, you know, that's gonna that's gonna be an issue soon for them. So I think if I were to ask you one one particular inhibitor, I think it's very good. Yeah, I think it's a really valid point. And there's also we know a lot of fee focus comes on from a regulatory perspective as well, sometimes not necessarily on the net of fee outcomes. And so that probably only works to reinforce uh, that, that sensitivity as well, which 
at times may not actually be aligned with generating the best outcomes for members and investors. And so these are the, the many uh, challenges and, and perhaps conflicting uh, objectives that we need to, to try and balance when we're making decisions on behalf of others. Uh, and now we're get, nearly getting to the audience Q&A. Before we do that, um, I'm hoping Rich is just going to indulge us in a, in a little bit of fun. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to play a very short, what I'm calling rapid fire with Rich. And Rich, I've got uh, essentially five questions for you and we just want nice short answers, one word, one sentence, couple of sentences, um, just to you know try to get to the, the, the crux of, of, of what you're thinking. So you ready to go? Happy to do that? I'm nervous, but I'm, I'll do my best, <laughs> Kylie. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, first one, biggest risk in 2022? I, I think overreaction. Um, <laughs> I had an email today questioning the market volatility year to date, and we did just have the biggest three-day drawdown in, since October 2020, but we're up 17% on a trillion-year basis. That's two years of normal stock market return. This is not volatility, guys. This, is, this, is, this isn't even technically a correction yet. So I think overreaction after that long period of, of stable well behaved capital markets. Uh, what do you think, what's your view of the single most important action for investors, right? Uh, it is diversification. I know that's boring, but it, it, there's such a bias towards past success in our portfolios and towards rewarding in-house staff and decision makers who, who didn't diversify. It shows up in home country bias. It shows up in public stock market allocations. It shows up in why are we holding so much in bonds and financing governments at negative real yields? Public or private markets? Private. Private. Oh, well, there you go. I'll give you a point for one word answer there. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Crypto, up or down? Sorry, say again? Crypto, up or down? Oh, down. I'm a, I'm a huge crypto bear. Um, yeah, and I if, if you're not looking at NFTs and think about gold, crypto, NFT as a continuum and think about where you're on in that continuum. I think it's a great speculative tool. If, if you if you need something different than going to gamble at a casino, but um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big crypto bear. Uh, feel free to ask Rich more about that in the, in the Q&A if you like. Um, now, look, final one, Rich, and this is the toughest one I have to say. You can only choose one holiday destination. Is it Australia or New Zealand? Okay, I'm going to upset, I think, the majority of our attendees and, and say New Zealand, but let me explain why. I've been visiting Australia for 25 years. I grew up a thousand miles from the nearest ocean, so I don't know how to surf. And but I've done lots of fun things in Australia. Lots of great nights in Sydney, Melbourne, Aussie Rules football, rugby union, just the, the Australian Open one year with clients. It's on my bucket list to take my kids snowboarding in Middle Earth. So that that's <laughs> got to happen at some point. And if, I don't know how many snowboarders we have on our phone, but if you're a snowboarder and if your kids, if your kids will actually snowboard with you, because mine are old enough that dad's not cool anymore. You know, it, it, but this is something they'll do with me. So, so that's, uh, so sorry, New Zealand. <laughs> well, I, I think Craig and I thought we might've had a home ground advantage there, <laughs> but uh, I, I can't begrudge you your answer because it is actually an amazing uh, country. And so you wouldn't be sorry, I'm pretty sure with a, a snowboarding trip to New Zealand. And that's definitely one for all of our New Zealand um, audience. So thank, thank you for um, indulging us in, in that little, um, Rapid fire with Rich. So we're going to move on now to audience Q and A, um, and I can see that we've got a couple of questions coming through here. So uh, let's just jump into that um, when I can read them. Okay, Rich, I'm going to come to you first. I think this is sort of talking about some of the stuff we were um, referencing earlier. But it says, um, is it challenging to have the next generation not um, have been through enough of these big downturns and could they be overly confident and not see the downturn coming up? And I wonder if you can perhaps answer that a little bit through your role as a leader of a big investment team and, you know, how do we as leaders with the next generation coming through, how do we make sure that they've got that, um, you know, that kind of perspective and, and can be risk aware even if they haven't experienced it a lot? I, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a risk. It's, it's a risk within our industry of, of overreaction and panic, but it's also a risk, you know, Craig mentioned the impact of, of explicit or implicit fee caps on different types of investors, whether they're regulatory imposed or market practice imposed on, on the ability to invest in private markets, the ability to diversify. So if you look at individual account programs around the world, 
Uh, we might have just lost Rich. Craig, you. I'm on here. Oh, yeah, you're back. I know. He's you're back. back. Yeah. We just lost you for a moment there, Rich. Sorry. I, I was probably going on at too much length about um, the accelerant effect of individual investors possibly giving up on public markets in a, in a real downturn when, when we lose 20 to 40 percent of stock markets and they're not coming back soon and there's a concern that they're headed towards zero. Um, I, I think that's a real risk at, at, a, at a macro level. And then investment professionals in the industry, I was lucky enough to be in Asia, Southeast Asia for the Asian financial crisis, to live in Japan when the bubble burst. So I've had a few more crises up close and lived experience than, than most people. And I'm old now, Kylie. <laughs> so um, I've lived through the GFC and some other things, but most, most people in our profession haven't, and it, it, is, it is a concern. So both, both public investors and, and professionals, I think it's a big issue. Right, thank you. Um, Craig, there's a, there's a question here sort of um, asking, particularly for our endowment and foundation clients, but increasingly I think other kind of clients as well, um, around impact investing. I mean, it's talking particularly to affordable housing in particular, but I wonder if you've got any thoughts and Rich, happy for you to share as well on the way that we're starting to see investors really want to, to balance or target uh, investment returns as well as having that sort of positive impact or sort of positive societal outcome yeah but as, look as i said before i think it's the you think about the, the debate the ESG debate over 10 20 years now you know, serious momentum and it's now just mainstream but if you if i just think about the conversations we're having there it is about impact um it's for those who have you know, been doing this type of activity for a while they want to move on they actually want to have you know an impact in an area um, affordable housing is, you know, is an interesting one. I actually used to you know, sit on a board where that was a major part of what they needed to do because that was the, sort of the, the, the actual mission of the, the, of the endowment. For general funds, if I say for super funds or non-funds you know, who aren't specifically, you know, don't have that as a specific mission, it becomes interesting. Um, you know, ultimately it gets down to, because affordable housing, and there's so many other issues involved regarding how do you get you know, a reasonable return back, you have to make that judgment. And I know in the case of that I was sitting on, it was a relatively easy judgment to make because it was part of the mission. Once it's not mission related, you've got to make that decision and that's, that comes down to governance and the board. But I, I, I definitely accept the, the premise of the question that it's an area that needs addressing, whether it's government or whether it's, you know, combined you know, funds and government coming together, that probably would be the right direction. But, you know, absolutely agree with the, the idea of, of impact, of funds and, and damage, wanting to wanting to have an impact, direct impact, it's it's growing, it's growing all the time. Yeah, and I, I think maybe if I can just add to that, because I, I think all those comments are, are, are great, but ultimately it comes down to one, you know, what are your priorities and um, uh, your, your mission, as you've described it there, but perhaps for an affordable housing investment, you, you're probably not expecting it to return private equity like returns mm. but that can be okay you don't want to be a charity at the other end of the yes. perspective yeah. you want the return but it's return for risk and and the outcomes that you're really balancing up there and so particularly if you can have an affordable housing investment that's got some kind of um you know guaranteed income or, or supported yeah. income that comes with it that's aligned with the risk that you're taking then obviously they can they, they can find a role within an investment portfolio that ticks all of those those boxes. Um, yeah, really interesting area that I think we'll only um, hear and learn more about. Um, Rich, I'm going to come back to you. There's a question here from Russell Garrett, who you might remember as a former colleague of ours from New Zealand, if you want to shout out, say hi to, to Russell. But he's asking um, about hedge funds. And um, they've had a bit of a tough time at late, of late, maybe not delivered quite what investors were expecting, um, particularly in terms of net uh, of fee performance. Um, so do they still have a role in a diversified portfolio? Hi, Russell. Um, good to hear from you. Um, I, I think they do. And, you know, hedge funds are an implementation model, not an asset class. And I might just jump in. Uh, yeah, you go, Craig. And also, hello, hello, Russell. Yeah, look, I think from our perspective, it's as Rich was about to allude to, it's, it, it, we, we wouldn't be making just carte blanche allocations to this sort of generalised bucket called hedge funds. 
I think it is a matter of strategies, it's a matter of fees, and it's a matter of how it you know, blends in with the, with the remaining 9% of your portfolio. I think that was potentially the mistake made in previous decades, you know, maybe five, ten years ago, why the return for risk and fees wasn't, wasn't coming back to us. But I think going forward, absolutely, it has a role because there's, there's, a, there's a diversifier there. There's, there's a benefit from investing in it, but it's got to be done specifically with each you know, portfolio. We, we lost you for a moment, Rich said. Was there anything you wanted to add to Craig's comments? Um, I thought Craig answered well. I was just going to say, yes, they have a role. I mean, the last 10 years is an environment where you would not have expected hedge funds to, to do well with directional markets. And, and um, you, you need to be able to pick the winners in, in that asset class as in others. Um, so there's a question here actually in the chat um, saying, is there a growing view that there might be another, um, it's talking more, more than a market correction, I think it's sort of alluding to a sustained bear market like the GFC. I mean, I'd, I'd say sort of off the bat that that's certainly not our base case view from here obviously we need to be cognizant of different scenarios and and we need to be mindful that you know we don't have perfect foresight and that's why a diversified portfolio is really important um but we do think that you know global growth is looking decent um that um you know that recovery which is flowing on into the corporate sector and corporate earnings will continue to be effectively supportive of markets as we move forward from here um that sort of extreme extended um bear market is is certainly not 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 our base case rich did you want to add anything to that well one it's not necessarily great for capital providers, so, so for investors, but a full employment economy with wage growth at the bottom of the wage scale for, for less highly comp people, this is awesome for income and quality globally and for opportunity for people to, to move ahead. And it, it reduces um, societal pressure, voter pressure against free trade, against globalization, against offshoring, against digital disruption. You look back a few years when we had issues with bigger issues with income inequality, with, with stagnated wages in developed markets globally. We saw the Trump administration elected. We saw US-China trade tensions. We saw Brexit. Things that weren't good for capitalism, free trade, progress of globalization, allowance of digital disruption. And in the six decades since the Second World War, we've lifted 4 billion people out of poverty globally. Democratic capitalism works. Democracies, by and large, don't go to war with each other. Capitalism drives success for everybody. And in a full employment economy, voters tend to let it run. So I, I think that's hugely bullish for the long term. But, but there are valuation issues. And our, I think our smartest clients are not hoping for the next correction, but getting ready for it because that's going to be their buying opportunity. They, they don't see yields out there, IRRs, cap rates, expected returns that they're happy with. So they're, they're trying to get ready to lean into that next major correction when other people are losing their minds and abandoning their, their risk postures and willing to sell at 80 cents on the dollar, they wanna be stepping up to buy. Terrific, Richard. Now we're heating up against time. Um, there was one final question here, which I might just answer very quickly. It's asking, how do we diversify our portfolios against rising geopolitical concerns? Again, boring, but I think the short answer to that is to diversify because those, but, you know, very difficult to predict, um, obviously, around what, what, hap what happens with the geopolitics. Um, and so your best defence against it, I think, is to diversify. Um, if you want to know more about that, we do talk about it a bit in the Mercer 2000, uh, sorry, 2022 Themes and Opportunities document um, around the changing of the guard and the changing geopolitical landscape. So it uh, might be worthwhile just if you've got access to the Mercer Insight community um, or the strategic research community to have a look at some of our papers that, that talk to that. Um, otherwise, we are out of time. It's been a really great discussion. I'd really love to thank our speakers today. Thanks, Rich, for, for joining us and Craig um, for giving us your insights as well. Um, I certainly got a lot out of it. Um, had a really great audience today too, which is terrific to see. Um, just one final request, um, please, if you can just quick, very quickly do the po post webinar poll on the way out. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback and otherwise we will see you next time. Thank you.